So our study is based on a study before it called PREPARE, which was the same acronym, but kind of like PREPARE1. Um, and in that study, they um, looked at MSM attending an STI clinic, and they found um, that 35% of participants didn't want to take PrEP because they didn't think they were high risk for HIV. So this was a big barrier because we know if you had an STI, um, you're having unprotected sex, and you know you are usually at high risk. So we wanted to look more at this. Um, and PREPARE2 is a randomized control trial, and we're looking at whether giving at-risk HIV-negative MSM with an objective risk score at the time of their HIV testing, and we want to see if that will affect their uptake of PrEP, whether they're go going on it or not. Um, and this is just the baseline data. Um, we haven't done the final analysis, and that will be forthcoming. So the CDC guidelines on HIV risk for MSM are probably the most well-known um, objective risk, school, uh, risk score calculator. And any score greater than 10 means you're at substantial risk. They don't really use the word high risk, um, but basically you either are at substantial risk or not. So to me, that kind of means you're high risk or you're not, and maybe you're low or moderate risk, however you want to look at it. And a couple things to note, um, just being in the age range of 18 to 28 gives you eight out of the 10 points you need to qualify for being at substantial risk and uh, possibly qualifying for PrEP. And um, having receptive anal sex without a condom with anybody, it doesn't matter if, whether you know they're HIV positive or negative, um, just one time within the last six months, you're at 10 out of 10 points, so you qualify for PrEP according to the CDC. And then for insertive anal sex, it um, has to be without a condom and with somebody who you knew was HIV positive. And that, that gives you six out of the 10 points. Uh, so we developed a UCSD objective risk score. I should say um, Dr. Blumenthal and Dr. Morris did. And the equation looks a little complicated, but if I can break it down for you, I think it'll make more sense. And it's just based on previous studies at UCSD and large studies um, like the PARTNER study um, done on HIV transmission and transmission patterns. So we're trying to use this study as a validation tool because besides the CDC score, um, which is kind of more predictive than objective, there's no consensus objective risk score. And the strengths of it is it only requires a month recall, so we believe that people will be self-reporting fairly accurately. Um, Six-month recall is what the CDC one uses, and um, I'm not sure everybody keeps like a six-month black book all the time. And we don't look at age or youth use of any drugs as prognostic. And we just look at the objective things, you know, where the risk, where the um, HIV transmission occurs. So, um, you know, and this has its disadvantages. We haven't validated it yet, and it's, you know, only based on a last month risk, and your risk can vary greatly depending on what you're doing for that month. So breaking down the math, um, the P1 is your insertive risk, your um, topping risk, so to speak, and we quantified that at about 0.75% per act. And the receptive risk was at 1.4%, um, just based on these large studies and kind of like looking at what the variables should be. And the IV drug use risk was 0.32%. So that actually was the, um, the lowest uh, uh, risky act, and that was shared, shared needle acts. Um, and then the X1, um, X2, and X3, you know, depending on the amount of times you do that, do the acts, you become more risky. So those kind of, um, those square or, or triple uh, or cube, you know, um, how, how much risk you have. And then the T value is just a multiplier for if you had a STI or herpes, which puts you at higher risk. So we also calculated self-perceived risk scores to um, compare them to the objective risk scores and to see if people were able to put themselves in the right category 
or how much they would underestimate or overestimate. And the first two questions were just about likelihood of becoming HIV positive, one in the next year, one in a lifetime. And the third question was, um, my gut feeling is that I will not get infected with HIV. So it was more, um, you know, based on a, a psychological, a visceral response. And the points for that one were reversed because if you disagree with that, then it means you think you're going to get HIV. And if you agree, then you, you think you're not going to get it. So the methods, um, sorry for these kind of funky arrows, but first we recruited H um, MSM from testing sites. They included the, um, the AVRC, um, Lead the Way, and um, the Tuesday and Thursday night clinics at um, family health centers. And we got 204 participants. 33 of them um, either tested positive or were ineligible. More and more people were becoming ineligible to participate because they were on PrEP already. And that was one of the stipulations. We couldn't measure PrEP uptake if you were already on it. So um, it kind of became an issue towards the end of the study as more and more people were getting on it. Um, you see, we started in 2014, and then we ended just a few months uh, ago in May 2016. So the inclusion criteria, just 18-year-old HIV negative by the rapid test, and one condomless anal intercourse act with a HIV plus partner or um, a partner of unknown status in the last six months. Um, and we had 171 people total in the um, data set. We gave an iPad survey that assessed a few things. Subjects were randomized either to get the risk score or not to get it. And so half of them got the risk score. And we want to see if getting the risk score makes them more or less likely to go on PrEP or if it affects it at all. And then we followed up in eight weeks and gave standard of care risk reduction counseling about condoms, PrEP, um, just what basically any patient who is at risk for HIV would get from their primary care doctor or wherever, wherever they're seen. So the statistical methods, um, we did descriptive summary for all the data, uh, just to look at the percentages of, of um, what people were uh, doing. And then there's a cross tabulation that I'll show in the next slides. Um, and we used a statistical measure called Cohen's Kappa coefficient. And this one, it's basically between zero and one. And less than zero, or it can be negative, less than zero means there's no agreement. And 0.2 to 0.4, less than that is, is poor agreement. And then we use the Fisher's exact test for other correlations, like perceived press candidacy and underestimation of risk. So the mean age of our study was um, 35. 63% uh, of our subjects were white. Um, 29% were Hispanic. About 29% of the population in San Diego, uh, well, actually, I have the demos. It varied from the general demos of San Diego a little bit, but not too, too much. Um, and then most had some college or higher. And in general, um, you know, about half of the subjects made more than $36,000 in a year, and half made less. So in terms of their risk behavior and awareness of PrEP, 7% um, of our subjects had an STI in the last month. And five of, um, they had an, a median of about five partners within the last six months. So um, they weren't the most sexually active group we've ever seen, but they had, they had risk and they were sexually active. Um, and of note is that 70% had at least one receptive um, condomless anal intercourse act within the last six months. Um, and that would qualify them for PrEP based on the CDC risk score. So, um, you know, 70% of our, our population qualified for PrEP right off the bat. Um, and 81% of them had heard of PrEP, which was um, a, a very much up from the original PREPARE study. So people know about it. But only 10% had ever used PrEP or PEP. So basically, this is our cross-tabulation. Um, the yellow numbers are where their self-perceived risk, or SPR, agreed with their UCSD risk or their CDC risk. Um, and for the CDC risk, we had to kind of combine our SPR in, from moderate, high, and very high into one category, um, because they only had, it was binary for them. Um, and if you see 
a lot of people put themselves in the low risk category. And I don't think any of us would have expected any, any, way, any other way. Um, and the weighted kappa estimate for the UCSD risk was 0.124. So it's below that 0.2 threshold for poor agreement. And then the CDC um, had even worse agreement. It was at 0.064. Um, and there was a decent amount of people who could correctly self-identify, but in general, the tables were skewed, and you know, people were thinking they were lower risk than they, they really were for the most part. So 38% um, of our subjects underestimated, and um, about 50% had correct predi predictions, which is decent. You know, um, it's good that 50% of them were able to say, you know, I'm low risk, and then they were low risk, and or if they're moderate, they are moderate. Um, and these kappas just are reported as the estimate with a 95% confidence interval um, next to it. And then we found that underestimators were more likely to have a STI in the past month. Um, and so, you know, despite having an STI, they still thought they were low risk um, or lower risk than they actually were. And but no other demographic or behavioral risk factors. There was no age or race or um, other factors, they did not have an effect on underestimating. And we included a visual analog scale asking how likely the subject thought that they would become HIV infected in the next year from 0 to 100. And we found that median people put themselves at 15%, um, which is, you know, it's kind of subjective for them, but in general, uh, I would say one out of 200 MSM seroconverts in a year. So you would think that might be more towards the 5% zone if people kind of knew what the baseline risk was um, for their demographic. Um, and then perceived PrEP candidacy, 57% of subjects thought they would be a good candidate for PrEP. And that was highly correlated with people who had greater than five partners in the last six months. Um, and those who put themselves higher on the self-perceived risk score. Um, but it was, again, not associated with any uh, racial or age or any other factors. So one thing of note is that we noticed that the highest risk indi individuals tended to underestimate their risk um, even more than um, people in the low and moderate categories. Um, and that's kind of of note, because who do we want to get prepped to? Well, we want the highest risk individuals to get it, I would say. Um, I think that's the best use of healthcare resources. So 32 out of our about you know 170 subjects were high risk um, based on the UCSD score, but only three of them placed themselves in that category. And 91% underestimated, and 38% put themselves two categories lower in the low risk category. Some ideas about why this um, is happening is that, you know, people, even us, I think everybody tends to assume that they're better than others at controlling the outcomes. You know, oh, I'm not going to be the one who crashes my car because I'm texting and driving. I'm smarter than that. I'm better than that. And, you know, so people may put themselves in risky situations because they just think they have control. And then based on desired end states, people kind of present themselves in the light they want to be perceived, even to investigators, even when they tell them that they're you know, this is confidential, anonymous. There's no one to um, please, no one to impress. Uh, they still have this idea of optimistic bias. Um, and you can see from the risk factors that they were um, pretty risky. So just some thoughts on how we can increase PrEP uptake. We think that um, accurate risk perception and focus on objective risk could help and to decrease the stigma for those, of, um, um, those in the community who choose to take PrEP. You know, the idea of a true vada whore is, I don't think it helps. I don't think it helps anybody. And um, we'd also like to see people accept PrEP and condoms as different, but both effective measures for prevention. And then just counseling and, and standard of care things, motivational interview, bundling PrEP with other pre uh, prevention methods like condoms. So in conclusion, we saw high discordance between self-perceived and actual HIV risk 
and a tendency to underestimate risk, particularly in those highest risk individuals. Um, so we saw that individuals with more partners um, and higher self-perceived risk were more likely to perceive themselves as good PrEP candidates. But does that mean that they're going to go get PrEP or be able to access it? Um, you know, the highest risk subjects were the ones who may need it the most, and they were unfortunately the, also the ones who were most likely to underestimate. Um, so our final results will inform whether giving this objective score to the groups, you know, comparing the control group and the intervention group, whether more in the intervention group went on PrEP, or maybe they didn't, maybe this, they had the same rates. Um, and hopefully it will help determine the barrier to PrEP for those who are interested. So um, that's my presentation for today. I just wanted to acknowledge the CCTG, um, the Skag School of Pharmacy, for supporting me um, in the summer research program. Dr. Blumenthal, the statistical staff, uh, Shelly Sun, and Sonia Jane, and then all the AVRC staff, um, especially Eric Ellerin, Marvin Hanashiro, um, Sheldon Morris, and, and it was funded in part by the C4 Core Grant. Great, Evan, thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> Questions for Evan? I have a question, Evan. I wondered uh, what proportion, I, I expect you had it up there, but I just didn't quite figure it out. Based on your more objective measures that you think most accurately projected the risk of acquiring HIV, they separated out the population, not the self-perceived risk, but mm -hmm. the actual risk. Do you think that tool could be used not only to inform patients and suggest they go on to PrEP, but also to uh, identify patients for whom the value of PrEP is quite limited, and perhaps to uh, not discourage, but to ask them uh, how certain it is PrEP is something they want to take. PrEP is not cheap. The current version, as you know, is over $20,000 a year, and most of it is funded by us. It's unquestionably valuable in the right audience, but is there a way we can make sure that we emphasize those who would benefit and perhaps dissuade those who are more worried well from using the drug? Yeah, I think objective risk scores can help a lot to do that. Um, just from like a holistic point of view, having the UCSD risk category, um, it gives you, you know, low, moderate, high, and very high. And from there, you know, the low risk category, we kind of, you know, we would say that people should, the utility of PrEP might be fairly low for them. Moderate is a, is a maybe, and then high and very high are kind of like, you know, really we, we would try to push people to go on PrEP um, because they're showing that they're not using condoms and they have risky behavior. Um, and then with the CDC risk category, I think that one is easier for primary care providers to use um, because it's just like, do you get to 10 points? And, you know, there, were, there was a big study that validated it. it they did all the sensitivity and specificity analysis. Um, so I think these objective risk scores can help. And I know a lot of centers are already doing them. Um, Great. Uh, Dr. McCutcheon. Yes, I wanted to be sure I understood uh, when you uh, chose to not include age in the UCSD score, the, the rationale behind that is... That so went by very fast, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I definitely know that age can be a, a highly predictive factor for objective, for risk. Um, but in calculating the UCSD score, I think they only wanted to use um, factors that led to HIV transmission. You know, being a certain age just does, I mean, it means in the populations, yes, you're at higher risk. Um, and that's just that they see younger people are more sexually active, but the score itself takes into account if you're sexually active. Um, and I think the CDC score is, is a great measure, um, but, you know, it can be, it can kind of be shocking for people who are 18 to 28 to find out that, oh, you know, I, I basically should be on, on PrEP, you know, no matter of what, what else I do. Uh, 
Okay, great. Alan, I think for you and I, it'd be like minus 10 points for our age. <laughs> Dr. Smith. Yeah, so I would, great work, great presentation. So just, uh, my name is Davey. Uh, we, we need to start introducing ourselves again, I guess. So, um, and disclosing our age, apparently. Um, <laughs> So my, my question is, you know, it's a good, I think a next follow-up, maybe prep three or prepare three might be to think about, can you test whether or not if you give somebody some objective risk score, do they actually have an increase in uptake of prep? Sort of getting back to Chuck's question, <coughs> does this actually might have a difference? And you could do a very nice, you know, randomized study of looking at uh, prep uptake when people are presented with sort of an outcome like that. Yeah, I mean, the study does that. The, the results are just pending. Um, this was a baseline analysis. And um, I believe, you know, we give half the subjects their risk score and then half don't get it. And we're, we call them in eight weeks to see if they're going to go on prep. I didn't focus on that too much because um, that's kind of like the primary endpoint of the study and we're not ready to release it. Um, I don't even think it's been looked at yet. It's kind of like the big secret, but I, I believe. I think that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, and I would, you know, I would have loved for this end to be a little higher. So I think a bigger study would have been great. But you know, we're limited by the amount of sites we had, um, and hopefully, you know, we'll have enough power to say say something. Okay, one final question. It's a question over here. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank no? you for your presentation. It was pretty interesting. And I particularly found it interesting that you saw this kind of disjuncture between, on the one hand, people saying that overestimating their likelihood of getting HIV. So it's 15% as opposed to 5, I think you mentioned. Yeah. And then also, on the other hand, they're underestimating how risky their behavior is. So I was wondering, like, is that really about um, control or the sense of lack of control that they are at this elevated risk of um, getting HIV um, because of their behavior, but they are sort of fatalistic about it. Yeah. Um, um, so to address the, the visual analog scale, I think you were talking about where they put themselves, it was just a sliding scale um, and about how likely they thought they would become HIV infected. We didn't kind of ask them out, right? Like, what's the baseline? What's the baseline mm -hmm. risk for people? Like, what? So they just kind of decided where they were, and it was a whole zero to 100. So people can be swayed to go to extremes on that kind of scale. Um, so I usually would see subjects kind of go, oh, all the way towards zero. Or if, if it was a subject, and there were fewer of these who thought they were really high risk, they were like, oh, I'm going up, way up here. So um, that was, it was an interesting factor. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there are, there's a, a bunch of confusing things about this, yeah. for sure, but I do think um, people don't assess their uh, risk too well. And sort of, um, sorry to continue, yeah, no, but fine. with the counseling um, that's now in the, uh, the part of the study that's continuing, uh, what role do you see that having in terms of people beginning to normalize their behavior or, or normalize their view of their behavior in terms of risk? Mm. Yeah, so I definitely think um, people who receive the score um, especially if it was a high-risk score, were reactive to that. Um, and I personally enrolled people for the study, so I, I saw that. Um, and um, I think just getting that score is going to affect their behavior. So they could, and we do measure some, uh, we send a, like um, an online survey along with this phone call follow-up to reassess their behaviors. So we may see that some of their risky behaviors go down just by being told that they're high risk. Um, so that will be an interesting thing to look at. Um, and I do remember one, one participant stating, oh, I'm not a sex addict. I, you know, I, I don't need PrEP or blah, blah, blah. And I was like, OK, I'm just, just telling you the, the survey said you're high risk. You know? So people have different reactions, for sure.